In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. You can't see it from there, but I'm wearing socks. And my socks, for some of the kids around, do you know what kind of socks I've been wearing this season? I see Charlie and Georgia knows. What kind of socks am I wearing? Can you tell me? Can you tell us? Advent socks. I have Advent socks. So this week, I'm not going to show you my leg, but you can see it after. I have Advent socks for every week. So you can come and look. This one is four weeks. And the first week is really, is really burnt low. It's kind of fun. So I'm wearing my Advent socks, and the children at Children's Chapel or with the pageant, they know that I've been wearing a different pair of socks every week. But what they don't know is that I'm wearing one different sock, or two different socks. The other one looks like this, and I know no one can see this, but if you're close, what other sock would I happen to be wearing, Abigail Akers? What do you think? A Hanukkah song! <laughs> I didn't even ask her before to prep. So Hanukkah, yes, right? Because it begins this evening. Eight nights of pure joy and surprise and, dare I say, miracle that when the temple was going to be rededicated, they thought they only had one, enough for one light, in the, um, excuse me, oil for enough uh, for one light. To light, to light. Wow, that was awful. I'm so sorry, everybody. It's been a while since I've been up here. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here, partly because you all have given me the task of reflecting on this particular passage this Sunday on Joseph. I have to say, I haven't spent much time with Joseph. You know, I like a lot of my saints, as many of you know. Mary is a particular character in the Advent season that really opens us all up for Christmas. But Joseph, I never really related to him because he seems so stoic. You know, Joseph was a righteous man. And he thought this thing and he was going to divorce her. And then he had a dream and he changed his mind. And then he was perfect the entire time. You do not hear from Joseph. You see a picture of him maybe when you're a kid teaching his son how to be a carpenter. But that's about it. We don't hear from Joseph, this staunch figure in our own Christian imagination, that we're supposed to follow. How do I even relate to this man that I know nothing about? I kind of know something about. I know his family and where he comes from. And I know that he stayed pretty faithful to Mary, even amidst all of that turmoil with society and what they might have thought about her. And Jesus? Is that supposed to be enough for me? And I wonder if that's supposed to be enough for you. So I thought about it. And again, I'm really grateful because most of the time when I reflect on these passages, I do three things. I look for myself. Where would I be in this story? And then I look for other people. Where are the other people? What do they look like? How did they, how did they interact? And then where can I find God in this story? So I kind of have to go through myself a little bit. Most of the time my sermons or my, or my reflections are a bit personal because God works through all of us in our personhood and what we know and what we've come to love and what we've come to care about. And so I invite you, too, to jump on in. Go ahead and close your eyes if it's helpful. Where would you be in the story? If it's helpful and you're like, what story did we read? Go ahead and look in your bulletin. I don't care. Take the bulletin home. Reflect on it this week, as I always encourage you to do. That's why we print it. Where would you be in this story? Would you be the Joseph that says, oh, well, if you're married, I don't, I don't want to disgrace you, I, I should probably do what's acceptable so that no harm comes upon you. So I will um, just back away. 
we won't get married, we won't continue this, so that you won't be disgraced. I'll keep my mouth shut, we'll be good. Or perhaps like one of the one of the kids getting ready for the Christmas pageant as an angel. Maybe I'm the angel that interrupts this story and says, hey, wake up. Wake up, do not be afraid. Have you ever found yourself telling your friends or your family, hey, wake up, just don't be afraid. Because maybe perhaps you too are like this angel that takes this moment and says, do not be afraid. You have to continue that sentence, right? Because God is with you. Because we can be afraid all the time, but when we know that God is with us, it kind of tempers our fear. Or perhaps are you with society, the people? No real character, just social customs and mores and the acceptable things. Where are you in this story? So I thought about it for myself. I'm not a big dreamer like Joseph, you know? So I'm like, oh, another strike against Joseph, you know? Righteous, faithful, and he had dreams. He had three dreams. One dream was this one that redirected his course of action. And the two others actually continued to direct his action. One was, don't go back there. Go to Egypt. Take your family and take them to Egypt. I don't know if you knew anyone there. But just go. So he took his family and went. And then his third dream was, okay, it's safe now to return. Come back. Man, his righteousness, his search for the truth, justice, what is right, what is correct, what is acceptable, and his faithfulness, those three dreams, powerful. But I can't relate to that. I don't really dream. For those of you who know me, I don't really sleep. So I don't really give God time, right, to work in that, in that way, in that space, in that pause, in that moment where my body can relax. I can be close to dead space, maybe even, or allow my brain to turn off its on button, like in our nervous system, right? It's either on or off. I don't allow more time to be off, to allow God to do something. So I'm like, how do I relate to Joseph? I'm supposed to give this sermon. And then I read something about the, being the adoptive, the adoptive parent to Jesus. I'm like, oh yeah, how does that work, right? As in our human minds, we try to make it all logical that Jesus had a mom, had God, gave birth through the Holy Spirit, and then had a human father, of course, of course, right? So he's the adoptive father. For those of you who know, I have three children. Some of you may not know that I am not the birthing parent of these three children. These three children have the same DNA from the same mom, who is my spouse, and the same DNA from another person that we don't know, called the donor. Now we've been telling our children that's how they were born. So I guess you can say I'm the adoptive parent. And for some reason, I'm like, I am, but we also decided to conceive together. So I don't want to say there's a difference. They're just, they're so, it's so complex when we talk about conception these days. Not just because of technology, but because of our, our households and our families and how we're, we've all been made up. Some of us are blood-related and some of us are not. And we're still family. And so I think of being the adoptive father and I'm like, oh, Joseph, I can relate. Because I wonder, and I wonder if he wonders inside. Was that too much of me being stern when they're not really my kids? But they really are my kids, so I can be that stern, or I can be that loving, or I can be that whatever it is. And so in the last couple weeks, some of you might have noticed in your feed or not, that um, the U.S. government passed with the Respect for Marriage Act. Um, and I thought about how that impacts my family in particular. And years ago when, when my wife and I decided to get married, um, it was protected here, we can get married in California, but we couldn't get married in 35 other states. And so years ago 
when I was looking for a job, my friend from Tennessee said, hey, why don't you look at this? It'd be awesome to have you, you know, have us work together. So the first thing we did, not even look at the job description, we looked at the state of Tennessee. And I would have had to adopt my children in the state of Tennessee because um, gay marriage is not, um, is not honored there or respected there. Again, one of 35 other states in the union who don't, who don't do it. So for my family, fleeing and staying and all of that, I'm like, oh, Joseph is really coming alive for right now in this week because thanks to, again, what many people, I don't know, I don't care really where you, where you are on the spectrum of the politicking of it, but thank God at least this low barrier of civil rights for many of us has been established because there's great fear that our rights as a married family, which then say that we now have children that we're responsible for, that can be taken away. And so this Respect for Marriage Act is now in place as a safeguard for that. I can go to another state and they would, they would federally have to acknowledge our marriage, which then super, um, assumes that I am my children's parents which is a really big, if you don't know me, a really big identity for me, right, as a parent. So, I would say surprise yourself and jump into the story and see what God has in store. And when you, when you think of, oh, I don't know if I can relate to a person like Joseph, or I don't know if I can relate to a virgin like Mary, or I don't know if I can relate, you know, think about it big time. God wants to find you there. So that's the first thing I do. I look at myself, and I know that it's not just me, you know, that I'm kind of sharing this reflection with. So then I want to look. I want us to look at others. I want us to look into the story for others. I think of Mary and Joseph, and I'm like, wow! In all of God's plan to have Jesus born, these are the two people you're going to choose to have everyday, daily life. For his entire life. Can you imagine if you were on the committee, the God committee, and had to decide who's going to be the parent of said Jesus, God incarnate in the world? Like, what characteristics would you look for? Last year, we did this whole search for a record. We came up with all these things, right? About who the perfect person or or person that works with this community would be for us. God did that in God's, you know three self <laughs> in God's trinity and planned that Mary and Joseph would be the parents to God. So that's why it's a little problematic for me because so many times we keep them very distant. I don't know if I can relate to Mary. I don't know if I can relate to Joseph. They're kind of perfect. But they're not because their society was not perfect. How do you remain faithful to what God is calling you to do when you've got everyone around you saying the opposite? That is not okay to live that way. That is against the law. Well, when the law doesn't work for you, you got to change that. So I think of Mary and Joseph, and I see them, and I wonder, as I'm looking at these presents, right, Thank you, everyone, who contributed to the giving tree. Because of you, six families out of Samaritan House's sharing program. Seven. seven. Oh, seven total? Seven, and I'm sure a few others, if some of you are doing it on your own, sneaky little people you all are, right? So that these seven families are getting the comfort of food, the comfort of care, and I'm not going to lie, some entertainment, some toys, some gifts, the gift of giving because of you all. If we were to imagine those seven families and see them as a reflection of Mary, Joseph, Jesus, God is with us. Joseph was supposed to name his son Jesus, right? I think in Hebrew it's something like Joshua, maybe it's something like saves. He who saves. That this little baby is going to save us all. Maybe save us all from ourselves. 
maybe save us all from those moments where we create barriers with one another that are not liberating, that are not freeing, that put people as a them and keeps us as an us. But I wonder, when I look at the others, this holy family, when we go deliver these presents today, be prepared to meet another holy family, everybody. Be prepared for that as you leave this church to meet holy people, holy families, that God is working something amazing, redirecting their lives, and they are following something to create a miracle amidst us. Are you paying attention? And so lastly, I'm kind of going to leave it to you, because I did a lot of work this week preparing for you. So I'm going to leave it to you. I'm not going to ask for answers now, but I really do want you to think about it. Right? The third part is now look and try to find God in this story. Where is God in this story? If we are all made in the image and likeness of God, then the opposite is true as well. That God is this miraculous, amazing, spectacular, unifying image of all of us being as faithful and righteous and just as possible. So I just wonder, St. Paul's, as, a, as people, individual people, consider being a little more like Joseph. He was kind of a, as I said, kind of like following the rules and understanding the rules for a particular moment and then open to being redirected. That when those rules didn't work for certain people, he followed God and that was the most aligning path he took. And then what if St. Paul's, as a community, what about if we all look up to each other and we all look up to our neighbors and we all look up like Jesus, redirected much of what we've been living as or for, continuing to align with God, what is that invitation for us this coming season? Let's say amen.